Hello and welcome to the second lecture of Bio 110 about cytoskeleton. Today we're going to cover the subject of microtubules. As we mentioned earlier, the cytoskeletal proteins can be, divi can be divided excuse me, into three groups. The intermediate filaments, shown here on the left, the actin filaments, here shown in the right, and the microtubules, shown here in the middle. These are going to be the molecules that we will be talking about today the macrotubules. So macrotubules, they form long hollow tubes of tubulin protein. They have the capacity to rapidly assemble and disassemble, and therefore um, we tend to think of them as having what is called dynamic instability. And the complete macrotubules form a dense network of molecules inside the cell. That network can serve as tracks um, to have organelles and vesicles move within the cells as they're attached to motor proteins that we're going to be discussed later today called kinesing and dynein. Now, when we think about macrotubules, let me show you this image here in the left that is showing a cell with a dense network of macrotubules. Right here in the center, you can appreciate the nucleus stain in red, and next to it, you can see a really dense area of green. That is the area where you have the macrotubule organizing center, the place where macrotubules emerge and distribute and radiate all throughout the cell. So in here, what you can appreciate are independent macrotubules being stained. So you see that the network of macrotubules, it is covering the entire cell and that it goes from the macrotubule organizing center here in the middle all the way down to the membrane of the cell, also helping push within the cell. Now, macrotubules can, in eukaryotic mammalian cells, macrotubules perform many different functions, and they organize themselves from a particular organizing center. In, in part B of the figure, what we have is a microtubule organizing center that we call the centrosome. And the centrosome contains what we are going to see, gamma tubulin, that is going to allow for the polymerization of the microtubules are they, as they extend from the microtubule organizing center and radiate around the cell. But microtubules could also be used during cell division. As you see here in C, the microtubule organizing center will become what we call the mitotic spindle, which are going to segregate as the cell is coming to divide. From there, microtubules will radiate and encounter the cell at the axis of cell division to help separate chromosomes. Last but not least, shown here in D, we have a ciliated cell, and the macrotubules form part of the cilium. Also, they form the same part of the flagella. At the base of the cilia and the flagella, what you're going to find is a specialized centrosome, which is called the basal body. And from the basal body is where you're going to have the polymerization of the macrotubule to form as the moving units to propel the cell around. So three different functions. One, the microtubules will form a dense network inside the cell for movement of vesicles and membrane. Two, cell division to help separate uh, the, the chromosomes during cell division. And last but not least, as the structure and powerhouse to move cilia and flagella for cell motility. So we think about the cell. Microtubules have a different structure than the actin filaments that we already saw. Microtubules are polymers of two proteins, an alpha and beta tubulin monomers. Those tubulin monomers will bind together, and when they assemble together, they will go into an arrangement in which the beta portion is going to be associated with an alpha portion, so the beta portion gets us from one dimer will get associated with the alpha portion of another dimer, and that can create a protofilament. So when we look at the macrotubule per se, the macrotubule will be an organization of about 13 to 14 protofilaments into a microtubule tube. 
The microtubule tube will have a hollow inner portion and 13 different uh, protofilaments forming a cylinder structure. Here in D, you can see the, the electron micrograph of the microtubule structure showing the hollow inside and the 13 different protofilaments. Now, since they are dimers on an alpha and a beta subunit, the minus N, which is believed to be the beginning of the microtubule, is always made up of alpha tubuling subunits all together around. And the plus N is always going to be beta tubuling subunits uh, facing around. So a single microtubule will form then the hollow structure with 13 different protofilaments of alternating units of alpha and beta tubulin. One thing that we're going to see later is that those alpha and beta tubulin units are bound to GTP. And the binding to GTP will be required to maintain the stability of the microtubule structure. Now, in order to make microtubules, you need to have an existing structure in which the microtubules could be nucleated. So in the central, in the microtubule organizing center, excuse me, you have a pair of centrioles and that is uh, covered by a centrosome matrix and the centrosome matrix contain nucleating sites. Those nucleating sites are made of a third type of tubulin called the gamma tubulin and gamma tubulin will form a small ring in which the alpha and beta tubulin monomers can associate to elongate and form a bona fide microtubule. Since alpha and beta tubulin are added um, stepwise to the gamma tubulin, then they can grow in the positive end. So what we show here in the middle in part B are it's the microtubule organizing center with different microtubule structures emanating from them. And here in structure C, what we see in blue are the pair of centrioles, in red the gamma tubulin ring complex, and in green the bona fide new microtubules that are being formed from the gamma tubulin ring complex. Now, the nucleation start, as I mentioned, it's the starting point of macrotubule assembly. In that way, the macrotubule will have a place to start building its structure and allow it to grow. The entire central, centrosome matrix and nucleating sites as a whole, we're going to call it the centrosome. Now, the centrosome is interesting because it's going to have macrotubules that are going to be growing, shown here in red, as they're extending up, and macrotubules that are going to be shrinking, followed here by the blue arrows. So, for example, when the macrotubule uh, grows, you're going to have GTP tubulin that is going to be binding to the positive sides, allowing for the elongation of that microtubule. However, when GTP tubulin hydrolyzes GTP, that is going to form a GDP tubulin, and that GDP tubulin is going to then induce this assembly, and that's going to be followed by the yellow arrow showing this macrotubule that is long but now has shrunk. So when the macrotubule hydrolyzes GTP into GDP tubulin, that is going to destabilize the macrotubule, allowing it to shrink. The growth of macrotubules compared to the shrinking of macrotubules is termed dynamic instability. Now, as shown over here, what we can see in A is a growing macrotubule. In the left, we have the the GTP tubulin dimer, which we call GTP tubulin, that is binding to the existing microtubules, forming what is considered to be a GTP cap. A GTP cap is called so because all the microtubules bound to it has GTP on their surface. When that GTP cap begins to grow, some of the GTP in the microtubule pairs gets hydrolyzed on the beta macrotubule subtubulin subunit, excuse me. So that hydrolyzed beta, that hydrolyzed GTP in the beta tubulin subunit 
um, now become more unstable. And that instability basically spreads towards the GTP cap, completely inducing the hydrolysis of the cap until you have what we have here on the right, which is going to be the shrinking macrotubule. Now, the protofilaments, as you see here in the right, that now contain the GDP macrotubules, begin to destabilize, not the ones in the middle, only the ones which are at the very end. That the, polymer the polymerization com allows for the macrotubule to begin falling apart, but only at the positive ends. And that is going to induce the uh, disassociation of the GDP tubulin um, dimer molecules to fall off from the macrotubule assembly. So what we have is that switch from the growing macrotubule to a shrinking macrotubule, we call this a catastrophe. Now, this process is reversible. Another GTP dimer uh, can now bind to the disassembling macrotubules, forming another GTP cap, which is going to induce the elongation of the macrotubule again. So when GTP tubulin binds and forms a new GTP cap, that GTP cap will induce growth, and we call that rescue. So the terminal dynamic instability, it's the dynamic switch between a catastrophe and a rescue event. The catastrophe is going to allow for shrinking of the macrotubules, and the rescue will allow for the elongation and polymerization of the macrotubule. So now, as we have mentioned before with actin, different molecules used in therapy can be used to study macrotubule assembly and disassembly dynamics. Colchicine, it is a molecule that can bind very tightly to the GTP tubulin. And when it's binding very tightly to the GTP tubulin, it's going to prevent addition of more GTP tubulin to the GTP cap and therefore prevents the growth of the macrotubule. On the other hand, the cancer chemotherapy agent Taxol can bind to macrotubules and prevent the disassembly of GDP tubulin. Therefore, even the macrotubule that had lost its cap when, bind by, when bound by Taxol, it's going to continue to be stable and in therefore it's not going to shrink back. Now, let me play you this film to illustrate the concepts of dynamic instability. Microtubules continually grow from the centrosome added to a cell extract. Quite suddenly, however, some microtubules stop growing and then shrink back rapidly, a behavior called dynamic instability. So that image, that video, excuse me, displayed the concept of dynamic instability, how the macrotubules grow and shrink. Now, let me show you this other video that is showing now a cell that has been um, labeled with a protein that binds to the cap of the microtubules, and you can then see how the cap moves from the microtubule organizing center to the edge of the cell. EB1 is a protein that binds to the GTP tubulin cap at the growing ends of microtubules. Cells expressing a GFP EB1 fusion protein reveal the spectacular dynamics of the microtubule cytoskeleton. Note that many, but not all, microtubules in this cell grow from the centrosome. Only the ends of growing microtubules are visible in this experiment. Those that are static or shrinking have lost their GTP tubulin caps and do not bind EB1. In contrast, when all microtubules are labeled with GFP tubulin, the true extent of the microtubule cytoskeleton emerges. Both growing and shrinking microtubules can be observed. Notice how densely populated the macrotubules are inside the cell.
So now, when we are thinking of a cell, here we have in A a cell that is uh, unpolarized, and we have a centrosome with macrotubules. Some of them are growing, as indicated by the arrows, extending away from the centrosome, and some of them are shrinking, as indicated by the arrows that are pointing towards the centrosome. This cell doesn't have polarity, meaning that the cell doesn't have a top or bottom, front or back. But macrotubules are going to be important to establish polar polarization of the cell. Bound to the membrane, what you can find are macrotubule capping proteins. Those macrotubule capping proteins are able to bind to macrotubules and therefore help establish polarity. So, what you can see here in B is that some of these macrotubules, like the one shown over here, are already bound to the macrotubule capping protein. That is going to allow the macrotubule now to grow into this direction as other macrotubules are now growing, like this second one over here, and eventually finds a macrotubule capping protein, it will now continue to grow and push the morphology of the cell towards the right direction. The other macrotubules shown here with the arrows pointing towards the macrotubule capping protein eventually reach the end and therefore are now elongating themselves to the side of the macrotubule capping protein, generating a shape for the cell. The other macrotubules that are not bound by the macrotubule capping protein are still going to experience dynamic instability and therefore will be able to continue growing or shrinking. In this way, the macrotubule cytoskeleton can be used to establish cell polarity, a place in which it's going to have a cell, for example, the right-hand side is going to be having different properties from the left-hand side. To illustrate this, let's look at this other movie, which is showing the macrotubules interacting with the endoplasmic reticulum. Governed by the principles of dynamic instability, microtubules constantly extend into the leading edge of a migrating cell and retract again. Superimposed on the dynamic microtubule cytoskeleton, shown here in red, the membrane network of the endoplasmic reticulum shown here in green, exhibits its own dynamic behavior as tubes are extended by motor proteins on the microtubule tracks. So what this movie shows is that the dynamic instability of the microtubule network can be used by the cell, for example, to extend and give also a dynamic nature to the endoplasmic reticulum. So in that movie, the um, microtubule network was shown in red, and the membrane extensions of the endoplasmic reticulums were shown in green. And as you can see, let me see if I can put the image uh, together here, for example, you can appreciate that the endoplasmic reticulum network is piggybacking on the macrotubule network. In that way, the endoplasmic reticulum can continue to be moved with the cell as the cell is, for example, moving. Macrotubules also serve to for the direct transport of organelles within the cell. A beautiful example of this is the transfer of vesicles within the neural cell. As we discussed earlier in class, a neuron has a cell body and has an axon terminal. The axon terminal is going to be interacting with a postsynaptic cell, for example a muscle or another neuron, to, that is going to receive the cargo, that chemical cargo from the vesicles release. So what we can appreciate from this is that within the cell body you have an area where most of the proteins of the cell are going to be made. Also from the cell body emani uh, emanates the macrotubule organizing center that is going to send macrotubules from the towards the uh, axon terminal where they're going to have their positive end. At that point, it means that macro, that cargo, vesicles that are made in the cell body, will be transported 
through a microtubule network to reach the axon terminal. And those are going to be the vesicles that will be ready to be released when the cell receives an uh, action potential that is going to induce the fusion of the vesicles to release their cargo to the postsynaptic cell. So those empty vesicles eventually need to be reloaded. And to be reloaded, they have to travel back to the cell body. So the empty vesicles are going to travel now using the same macrotubule network to the cell body and therefore be reloaded to be transported again later to the axon terminal. Now, this will be a, then a good point to introduce the motor proteins that are going to facilitate the movement of vesicles from one side of the cell to the next. So let me introduce you to two of the motor proteins involved in macrotubule movement. The first one is going to be kinesin and the other one is going to be dynein. Both of these proteins are motor proteins that are going to use the macrotubule as a railroad track to move organelles and cargo from one side of the cell to the other. As we discussed early, the macrotubules emanate from a macrotubule organizing center and they grow on their plus side. So therefore, the plus side is the more distal side of the macrotubule to the macrotubule organizing center, and the uh, minus n is the more proximal side to the macrotubule organizing center. Kinesins, a family of ATP binding motor proteins that uh, bind to cargo, move from the minus end to the plus, to the plus end of the microtubule. On the other hand, their closely related cousins, dynings, are another family of motor proteins that now move from the plus n in the direction of the minus n. So while kinesins move towards the plus n of the macrotubule, dynings are going to move towards the minus n of the macrotubule. And in that way, one single macrotubule can serve as a track for both kinesins and dynings to move along. Now, both dynein and kinesis are motor proteins that hydrolyze ATP to move. So in that regard, they are very similar to the myosin proteins that use actin as a railroad track. They have very different structures, um, but in a sense, what makes them similar is that they both contain a pair of globular heads. In that regard, they resemble a lot more the, my the myosin 2 that uses acting instead of myosin 1, which is a simple, a simple globular head. So what we're going to see is that the movement of kinesing and dining involves the uh, stepping of one globular head over the other one and vice versa. In that way, the molecule seems to be walking over the macrotubule railroad track. So the head portions are going to contain the ATPase capable of hydrolyzing ATP. So what they're going to have is a progressive step-by-step -step movement as illustrating here in part B that is going to allow them to move and walk along the macrotubule. In this image, what we have is a computer model of a kinesing molecule that is moving along the macrotubule. Each one of these steps, it's marked by a number, step one, two, three, four and five. What you can appreciate is that um, a single step is able to move what it seems over an alpha and beta uh, tubuling pair, allowing the molecule to be taking small steps as it is moving along the macrotubule. In the insert part that we have here, the portion here, A, it's illustrating a single kinesing molecule that has been fluorescently tagged to be able to be uh, observed under fluorescence microscopy. As you see with time, the molecule is moving along towards the positive end. To illustrate this better, I'm going to show you the following film. The motor protein kinesin is a dimer with two identical motor heads. Each head consists of a catalytic core and a neck linker. In the cell, kinesins pull organelles along microtubule tracks. The organelle attaches to the other end of the long coiled coil that holds the two motor heads together. The organelle is not shown here. In solution, 
Both kinesin heads contain tightly bound ADP and move randomly, driven by Brownian motion. When one of the two kinesin heads encounters a microtubule, it binds tightly. Microtubule binding causes ADP to be released from the attached head. ATP then rapidly enters the empty nucleotide binding site. This nucleotide exchange triggers the neck linker to zipper onto the catalytic core. This action throws the second head forward and brings it near the next binding site on the microtubule. The attached trailing head hydrolyzes the ATP and releases phosphate. As the neck linker unzippers from the trailing head, the leading head exchanges its nucleotide and zippers its neck linker onto the catalytic core, and the cycle repeats. In this way, kinesin dimers move processively, step by step, along the microtubule. Hydrolysis of ATP, exchange of ADP for ATP. Okay, let's continue. Here is another film, and what we have in this film is a single macrotubule network, and we have taken the kinesin and dynein molecules and labeled them so you can appreciate them. So what you're going to see are the little vesicles moving along this single microtubule molecule. In this experiment, a cell homogenate containing many different organelles is added to microtubules. Motor proteins are normally attached to the organelles. When ATP is added as a fuel for the motor proteins, some organelles bind microtubules and are moved along the tracks by their motors. Most kinesin motors move towards the plus end of microtubules. Dynein motors always move in the opposite direction. Both motors are used to transport organelles, and occasionally a single organelle, which must have both types of motor attached, can be seen to switch directions. The bidirectional traffic observed here is reminiscent of that in an intact cell. So with that, we'll conclude the lecture.